All right, guys, <clears throat> as you can probably tell, I am not feeling my greatest. I have been fighting the flu for about a week now, but uh, the show must go on, so here it goes. Uh, we're going to be starting our reconstruction notes today, and it's, it's several pages just like the Civil War notes. Um, it's a lot of information. Um, it's going to cover a span of about 12 years, and something to keep in mind when we talk about it, 12 years to completely reconstruct a nation, okay? As we talk about this, think about, does 12 years seem long enough? Um, in the grand scheme of, of, of the history of the United States, is 12 years really long enough to completely redesign, uh, reconstruct uh, the economy of the South, the thinking of the South, uh, and the unity of the nation as a whole? All right, so let's keep that in mind as we click through these here. Uh, first, we're going to start with some key terms. And it's going to be introducing you to the president who followed Abraham Lincoln. Um, when Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson, uh, the vice president, is steps up to be president. Um, that's the line of secession. Um, Johnson is a Southern Democrat. And Lincoln chose him as a as a, an attempt to bring unity to the nation. The Civil War is winding down, and it's pretty obvious at this point that the Union is going to win. So in 1864, when Lincoln comes up for re-election, uh, he's going to pick a Southern Democrat to try to help bring the South um, back into the folds of the federal government upon victory in the war. Okay. Uh, Johnson's not going to be very popular. He's actually going to be impeached in 1868 because of how he handles Reconstruction. Uh, so if Lincoln had a flaw, uh, it might have been in choosing his running mate in 1864. Uh, unity, the, the stretch for unity kind of overshadowed this guy's um, unsavory qualities, we'll call it. So I need to talk about radical Republicans. So, radical today means crazy, right? Radical back then was more, it was a description of how far away from the Democratic side of things that they were. So, a radical Republican was, was a congressman who took an uncompromising approach to the South. Okay, and that means uh, they wanted to punish the South, they were going to take a hard line against one, freeing the slaves, two, giving them rights, and three, allowing them to vote. Uh, they were taking a very hard line against ex-Confederate soldiers, as far as especially the, the generals and, and up, or the, the higher ranking soldiers. Um, they wanted to punish them for their acts of treason. This was a radical idea um, to the Southerners themselves and the Democratic Party, because that's where they get the idea of radical. Don't let radical throw you to think that these these guys were crazy they were just exceptionally committed to shaping the nation back into a whole and actually punishing those that had torn it apart in the first place you need to know what a scallywag is um it's a nickname for a southerner who actually supported the republican party during reconstruction um, these were not very popular people in their home states, home counties, home cities. Um, the South was predominantly run or predominantly backed the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party had, had forever supported slavery and their way of life and protected that. And, and they looked to the Democratic Party to continue that even after the Civil War as best they could now that slavery was actually outlawed in the Constitution. Um, a carpetbagger. So a scallywag is someone who lives in the South and supports the Republican. A carpetbagger is a northerner who moved to the South uh, to become involved in politics and business. Uh, they were taking advantage of the situation down there uh, and, and gaining, trying to gain power and political gain and, and status and money. All right, so carpetbaggers, northerners in the South were pretty well distrusted by Southerners. They didn't think they were there for a good reason, and they didn't really like him being there uh, at all. 
excuse me. Um, the Thirteenth Amendment. We've talked about this several times now. It outlawed slavery in the United States. Boom, done. No more. Um, no more state-sanctioned slavery is allowed. And this amendment is going to. It was that final step that started with the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Which was step one, kind of getting the idea out there. And everything that followed through the war, the 13th Amendment was what takes over as, as officially ending slavery. Uh, followed by the 13th is the 14th. And this granted citizenship to all people born in the United States. Remember... Uh, the courts had said that slaves and African Americans were not people, they were not citizens, they were property. Okay, so they, um, get this working for me, they, they had to make an amendment to the Constitution to overrule this judgment and to give citizenship to anyone born in the United States. This does not apply to Native Americans because they're their own nations. Okay, something a little weird there, but it is what it is. Uh, the 15th Amendment. Voting rights. Now, ladies, sorry, this still doesn't give you the right to vote. We're still decades away from that. Uh, but this says, the 15th Amendment says that voting rights cannot be denied due to race, color, or previous condition of servitude, or being a slave in a former life. Okay, so the 15th Amendment gives the right to vote to any male in the United States at this point. Still not quite to the 20th Amendment, which gives women the right to vote. All right, um, let's talk about what Reconstruction actually is. So Reconstruction is a 12-year period following the Civil War. And what it was, it was this, this guided effort by the, the federal government to rebuild political structure of the South, uh, the social structure of the South, and the economic structure of the South. So it's this push to redesign how government works, how people interact, and how the economy is based on still agriculture, but agriculture using paid labor, no longer slave labor. Um, it's, it's a push to incorporate former slaves into free society and what's that going to look like? Uh, how is that going to be taken? Uh, is it going to have to be enforced at gunpoint? Yes, it will. Uh, are, are they going to have the same opportunities as Southern whites? Uh, no, they will not. It's going to be a long process. And again, that's where that whole 12 years comes in. Is 12 years really long enough to take an entire major portion of the nation who has for generations followed the pattern of plantation ownership and slavery, uh, how do you switch that overnight to be accepting of those of other colors, to be willing to work with those of other colors, and, and to, to integrate them, to actually meld them into society as a whole, and not just, just push them off to the side, okay? And it's going to be it's going to take 12 years. I, honestly, personally, I think it should have been more like 25 years and, and things should have gone differently, but we're going to talk about that. All right. Some of the challenges uh, that they're, they're going to have to decide, they're going to have to answer, are how are we going to allow those southern states back into the Union? Uh, the war is over. Are we just going to say, welcome back? Uh, is there going to be some sort of punishment? Is there going to be some sort of requirement for these states <clears throat> to to reach, to, to attain to, uh, before they can actually join the Union again. And, and quite literally, the question of can the nation even be reunited at this point after this terrible civil war, and, and just the, the tensions and, and the hatred and, and the issues that come along with freeing the slaves, is it even possible to make the South and North one again? Um, the economy, we've destroyed the southern economy, right? It was based on slave labor, and now slavery is outlawed, okay? We all know that's a good thing, but who is actually going to work in the fields now? How is that going to look? 
how are these farmers going to pay these people? Is are the price of goods going to go up? Uh, it, it was a, <coughs> a thousand different questions. <coughs> excuse me, that had to be answered on how to transform the southern economy into a paid labor system like in the north after generations of it being a plantation slave labor system. Okay? Uh, these are hard questions. There's no right or wrong answer, to be honest with you. It was, it was let's see what works and what doesn't. And unfortunately, some of the things that they did absolutely poor decisions uh, and really set back relations. Some things were great and some things helped while other things not so much. Um, okay, you're a slave and now you're all of a sudden set free. Great, you have no job, you have no place to live, what are you going to do? So how are the, the slaves, former slaves, even going to, to live at this point? Um, and before we get to the 15th Amendment and, and others following, will, will they have the same citizenship rights in the South? Uh, is that going to be a requirement for the Southern states to enter the Union? All these questions have to be asked and answered, and it's not a quick process. And there's going to be a time, especially initially right after the war, where the suffering is going to continue as the slaves... Some of them try to leave the plantations that they live on their entire lives and find new lives. Some don't even imagine leaving. Like, where are they going to go? They know nothing else. Um, they don't have any money. How are we going to get fed, clothed, education? All these things take time to answer. And, and that delay is going to cause some suffering through the Civil War and into Reconstruction and even beyond, honestly. All right, so these are the challenges. These are this is the time period. So let's uh, let's talk about what actually happened. All right. So first, we're going to talk about presidential reconstruction, uh, and this is this is led obviously by the president. First, it's going to be Lincoln's hope uh, for a compassionate reunion of the nations, for for the states to come together uh, to to be forgiving and to, to, to move forward as one. That was Lincoln's hope. Now, understand Lincoln is not going to get the opportunity to actually implement his form of Reconstruction. He's going to be assassinated five days after the, sec after, uh, uh, the surrender of Appomattox. But he did have these ideas that he put in place, or that began to put in place, uh, that we're going to follow. So the 10% plan. So pardons are offered to any confederate anybody from the lowliest private to the highest general uh, who would swear an oil of lo loyalty to the united states the, uh, they literally a paper you said that says i will never commit treason i am a loyal u.s citizen um once states um have reached 10 percent of their population that have signed these loyalty lo these loyalty oaths they can re-enter the Union. Okay, that was part of Lincoln's plan. Um, he also thought of the Freedmen's Bureau, and this is going to last this whole, a whole seven years. Uh, but it's going to, its task is going to be to help former slaves transition into free society, understanding that we need to get them educated. Uh, they need to understand the laws of the nation. They need to understand what they can and cannot do, what can and cannot be done to them. Uh, they need to be protected from those who don't agree with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, and, and honestly, initially, it's more about providing them food, shelter, clothing, <coughs> just the basic necessities of life than anything else. Since all of a sudden, even though they weren't paid, they are now unemployed. They don't own any land. Uh, the places that they were living are often owned by the plantation owner who had the option to kick him out or to have them stay and start charging them rent even though he knows they don't have any money. I mean, it was a whole big thing. And the Freedmen's Bureau was set up to help not only provide food and shelter, but to help them transition and to understand, okay, you know, your labor is worth this amount and you should expect this and so forth. And it's, it's, a, it's a process. Remember, this is a generational issue. 
slavery had been going on since for generations of uh, family, you know, grandfather, father, son, even before that a lot of times. And, and that the idea of freedom was new. They didn't understand exactly what they could, could not do, and what they should be expecting out of their freedom. Now, Congress, um, they don't like this idea. The radical, radical Republicans think the South should be punished. So Lincoln's, Lincoln's plan uh, gives us this out for the planter class, the, the higher uh, social status people in the South, uh, to regain power. <clears throat> There's no limitations on who can run for office. It's, it's just 10% of you said you're loyal, great, let's go, we're back to normal. Uh, and the Republicans say, no, 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 that's not how that works. We, we want to see some, some consequences uh, to the South and the, the treachery and the treason that, that split up the Union. Um, so presidential reconstruction is going to take a vast turn uh, right after it starts, actually, because Lincoln's assassinated and Johnson takes over. So when Lincoln is assassinated and Johnson becomes president, his plan looks a little different than Lincoln's. So his plan is to pardon all white Southerners except for the Confederate leaders and the very wealthy planters. So that smaller class, that top 1%, and the Confederate leaders like Jefferson Davis and his cabinet and the government and the generals like Lee and Longstreet and some of the guys that survived the war. Um, that's his issue. That's his plan. Uh, a little different from Lincoln, who said everyone can be pardoned. Um, he's going to demand that states elect new representatives and form new governments. Governments, Confederate governments, must be dissolved, and completely new and free elections must be held to restart the governments uh, in the form of the Union, now the federal um, ideas. Um, the states had to ratify the 13th Amendment, outlawing slavery. If they did not do this, they could not join the Union. They had to accept the 13th Amendment and the fact that slavery was officially banned. Um, on top of this, land is going to be seized um, during the war. Like, like when, when the army comes through and wins a battle, they're going to take people's plantations and people's farms and they're going to use them. Uh, and really, they're going to kick out the larger plantation owners um, as punishment for supporting slavery and supporting the Confederacy. Um, so Johnson says, hey, look, we're going to return that land to the previous owners. So on one hand, you're, you're, you're denying pardons to these Confederate leaders and wealthy planters, but you're giving them back their land at the same time. So the punishment is it's it's kind of softened with the fact that they get their land back. Um, it also puts the white Southerners in charge of transitioning from the slave economy to the free economy, the paid labor economy. Uh, so you're asking the people that maintain slavery to figure out a way to get rid of it, oftentimes not wanting to. So the fact that the former slaves are given no role in this decision-making and no political power is kind of an issue. Um, uh, obviously, the, the former Southern Confederate leaders and, and, and those in charge don't have a huge incentive to just give rights and power to the now freed slaves. Um, they're going to fight it, and they're going to... While they can't maintain slavery, uh, they're going to enact laws and things like that that simply don't uh, actually benefit um, the newly freed population. So let's talk about those real quick. The Black Codes. So these are laws that were passed in the South that severely, and I mean severely, restricted uh, the legal rights of the former slaves and, and, and restricted the, any economic opportunities that they might have. It restricts them. They're going to stay on the farms. They don't have the option to work some certain places. Um, yeah, we're paying them, but we're not paying them well, and, and they're staying where they were. They're, they're out of society. They're, they're on the farms working, uh, working hard to support themselves because now they're responsible for paying for food and clothing and shelter, uh, and, and they're limited in what they can do so that they can't even join... Um, 
the higher ranks of society, politics, all that kind of stuff. Um, many of the ex-Confederate leaders are going to return to power at the state and local levels. Um, a lot of Confederate generals are going to be elected to Congress, uh, elected to governor of their states, uh, and even elected into the federal um, ranks. Uh, and this, this, this doesn't reconstruct anything. You're just putting the same people back in power uh, and demanding them to act differently. That You can't have slaves, but you don't have enough power to make them not do things like the Black Codes. Um, they did everything they could to limit the effect of the 13th Amendment. These Black Codes in the South, um, it, was, it was almost slavery. I mean, it was as close as you can get with actually calling it slavery at a lot of points. And this, this shows you that the whole idea of 12 years, it's not enough to change the mentality of an entire nation. And the fight for equality for all is going to be set back because of those ex-Confederates being put back in power and the black codes that are allowed to be enforced. Um... The whole right to vote. Well, now we're going to charge a tax to vote. That's what a poll tax is. You have to pay a fee to actually vote. Well, that limits the amount of people that actually do it, right? If you're dirt poor, how can you afford to pay to vote? Um, blacks can't serve on juries. Well, that limits their voice in, in government right there, right? They can't own a weapon, so how are they going to protect themselves? If they don't have a job, they can be thrown in jail. Uh, they can't assemble in groups in public. All these codes severely limit um, the freedoms of the newly freed slaves, uh, the former slaves and their families, and it restricts any chance of a quick transformation or trans or a quick transition into society and, and becoming actually not just a portion of society, but part of society. Um, radical Republicans. They refuse to allow former Confederates into Congress. Uh, those that were elected by their states that were sent to Washington, D.C., they are not sworn in. Uh, and the Congress is going to take over Reconstruction. Johnson's plan with the pardons and who can run and, and who's in charge doesn't work for the Radical Republicans. It's not harsh enough. It doesn't, it doesn't make things change. So Congress is going to take over, and we're going to see what they do tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. For those of you in class, I'll, I'll do this live. For those of you not, we'll, uh, hopefully I won't sound like a 90-year a year smoker here, uh, the next video that I do on Reconstruction. So you should have finished your, man, the front page and all the way through Johnson's plan today. Uh, we'll probably break this up into another three or four groups, just like the Civil War, and then we'll continue on with some assignments before we wrap up and start Star Review. All right? Uh, hopefully, very few of y'all are actually watching this. I want y'all in class live for this last six weeks. I would love to see. Remember, guys, we have not had any positive COVIDs the entire year from Classroom Contact. Um, I have the flu. I don't have COVID, so... So it's safe to come back if, 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 you can, if you can get there, let's get there. For eighth graders, guys, this is your last chance. This is your last six weeks at Bowls. Um, I'd love for you to participate in it with us, all right? Um, make sure your notes are complete through Johnson's plan, and I will see y'all tomorrow.